Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our final spotlight session of the day. What a good day, right? A lot of amazing sessions and great speakers, and we are going to continue with that tradition right now. Our final spotlight speaker is LJ Justice, who is a senior principal in the CIO research group at Gartner. Their areas of expertise include IT talent, driving resilience in a hybrid work environment, and supporting diversity, equity, inclusion in IT. Since joining Gartner in 2018, LJ has contributed to several enterprise-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and served as pride at Gartner's global co-chair from 2019 to 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for LJ Justice. Come on out. Hello, everybody. They didn't leave a table out for me, so I'm going to have to pop this down on the floor. Thank you for being here with me today. I appreciate it. I come from a long line of educators. My parents work in public education. My grandparents worked in public e education. So it feels really special to kind of be back to talk here with you today. I had a lovely introduction, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is LJ Justice. I use they and them pronouns, and I'm a senior principal in the CIO research group at Gartner. I've been at Gartner for about five years. And over the course of the past eight months or so, myself and five other Gartner researchers have conducted over 60 interviews with chief information officers on the topic of allyship. And what we learned from those conversations is that you're really excited. You're really eager to learn, to grow, to develop as allies. We know that many of you are starting to explore and understand how you can benefit how your peers, your employees, and even personal relationships can benefit from the work that you are putting into being an ally. And now I'm not going to name any names, but some of you even told me that you maybe kind of sort of told somebody that you were an ally, just to avoid criticism, even when you had no idea what it meant to be one. But I'm assuming that by you being here with me today, that you see allyship as a journey that you're either willing to or wanting to take. So rest assured, with the next 40-some minutes, we're going to be talking to you about how your fellow CIOs are committing to their own allyship journeys by overcoming from the fears that they have and how they're committing to recovering gracefully from some of the mistakes that they've made along the way. And my last little piece here is that if you can take one thing that we learned together today and commit to practicing compassion and empathy continuing to learn from your mistakes and growing from those. You will be doing the work of an ally. So let's dive in and talk about it. Recent national events, including the pandemic, have really highlighted the impact of inequities that exist across the globe. They've also highlighted the vital importance of purposeful and intentional diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, at work. And I already know from talking with many of you that you're already asking yourselves, well, what more can I do? As CIOs, as CTOs, what more can I do to create safer, more equitable, more respectful teams? And just by asking yourself this question, you're already realizing that the responsibility for driving this change falls on all of us. And the way that we can purposefully and intentionally contribute to this change is by practicing allyship. So here we are a few minutes into the presentation, and I've said allyship, allies, and ally. And I'm sure you're sitting there thinking to yourself, OK, yeah, great. But like, what is it? That's a great question. So earlier this year, when I interviewed you, I asked you to define allyship for me. This is what you said. You said allyship is about standing beside someone, lifting them up. You said allyship is about taking action to dismantle the barriers that exist for other folks. You said allyship is about acknowledging privilege. You told me that allyship was all about speaking up, committing to being an ally out loud. And I loved your definitions. My team loved your definitions. So we stole from you. We took your definitions to create our own, and this is what we landed on. Allyship is about acknowledging privilege and committing to taking action by using that privilege to speak up for and stand beside those who are marginalized. 
I'm going to leave this up here for a second. And my question for you is to reflect on this definition. I want you to read this, and I want to see if you can find yourself in this definition. Do you see any part of this definition reflected back at you? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, what does it mean to acknowledge privilege? How am I taking action? Who am I speaking up for? Who am I standing beside? And if you find yourself asking those questions, I would say those are really fair questions to ask. And while I don't necessarily have the data to help you to understand where you are in your allyship journey, I do have some data on how your fellow CIOs are thinking about their own allyship journeys. Many, most, 75% of senior IT leaders say, you know what, yeah, I'm an ally. I encourage and I enable most of my team, all of their team, to bring their authentic selves to work. And typically, this would be a really exciting data point for me. It would be the data point that would get me out of bed to say, that's great, my work here is done. But I want you to remember that saying you're an ally is often a little easier than being one. So when we looked at this data, we found a bit of a gap between CIO intention and real world results. Because when we asked your employees, less than half, only 48% of your IT employees ultimately agree that you're helping them to be their authentic selves at work. Let's talk about it for a minute. This is hard. Allyship in and of itself is hard. It's difficult. And while your intentions may be pure, they can ultimately fail to have any impact if they're meaningless. And something that I learned during this research process is that a lot of you tend to equate niceness and kindness to allyship. That's great. My own personal ally, Harry Styles, that's right, I said it. He says we have a motto, we should treat everybody with kindness, we should treat people with kindness. And I love that and I think I live by that. But what we really learned is that niceness and kindness are just feelings. They're feelings that we feel about how we treat other people. It's not really enough at the end of the day to move the needle, to get us to where we wanna be, right? To push forward our diversity, equity, and inclusion outcomes and to act as allies. Effective allyship is gonna require us to take a little bit of action. So like I said, I interviewed several of you and I uncovered a list of reasons that makes it hard for you to put your allyship into action. So I wanna show you. Many of you said, you know what? Cancel culture, scared of it. I get that. Many of you didn't wanna say or do anything that would put you or your organization at risk. Some of you said, LJ, allyship is hard because it's difficult to challenge the status quo. It often means that I'm going against my peers. And you're not alone. We know that 55% of the senior IT leaders that we surveyed feel that their actions as a leader today are more scrutinized than they were three years ago. We also heard from a lot of you that you just didn't want to be a bad ally. Forget it. It's easier to not be an ally at all than to be thought of as a bad ally. Some of you said, there's more risk for me if I were to get it wrong than if I were to actually end up getting it right. One more time, our data backed you up. We know that almost half of senior IT leaders are deeply concerned about damaging their reputation if they were to mishandle addressing a very sensitive issue. And our final two here. Some of you said, you know what, I don't want to come across as patronizing. The words tone deaf, virtue signaling also came up here. We heard from you that this work of confronting your internalized biases, mm -mm, just plain uncomfy. And one more time, less than 20% of senior IT leaders feel comfortable appearing vulnerable in front of their IT employees. Let's pause. Less than 20%. The number is dismal. Very sad. I get it. Vulnerability as a leader is exceptionally difficult. And I like to think of it as a soft skill that we're all really motivated to finesse to try to get this right. 
but it's difficult. But if you're here today because you're genuinely interested in learning more about allyship, it is a soft skill that your employees are looking for more and more in many aspects of their job, but especially when it comes to identifying other allies. So the interesting piece from all of this ethnographic data and from all of the quantitative data is that we found out what was holding you back. Fear. Was fear. Is fear. The fear of getting it wrong. The fear about what it might mean about us if we get it wrong. And the fear of making a mistake in front of somebody else. So if you're really here to push yourself out of Lepito, to move forward, my biggest piece of advice for you today is to start to learn how we can chip away at some of those conscious and unconscious fears that we're still holding on to. And it's really important for us to learn how to do this work so that we can model the right behaviors for everybody else. So my takeaway, fear not, fear not. We have four cases today that we're gonna walk through. I'm gonna teach you how we can work together to overcome our own fears as it relates to allyship. And then how we're gonna pivot and recover gracefully from those mistakes so we don't fall off the trail altogether. And a common theme that we found throughout all of these cases that wove them all together was this idea of pre-planning or pre-scripting. So even though we're afraid and we're addressed with our fear one-on-one, -on -one, we can know ahead of time how we should act as an ally, how we can act as an ally. And then that way we can lean into those behaviors and start to practice them more authentically. So I'm gonna show you um, our first case here is from Akibia. For those of you who aren't familiar with Akibia, they are a pharmaceutical company based in Boston. They specialize in delivering therapeutic treatments for kidney disease. And if you've ever heard of the saying, I had never heard of this until this case, but if you've ever heard of the saying, name it to tame it. This case really embodies that saying. You need to name your fear to tame your fear. So I wanna show you how we do this. So one of the things about fear, even when it comes to allyship, is that it tends to be a little ambiguous, right? I think we can all safely admit that we feel a little bit afraid, but it's hard to understand why. What's really driving this fear? What's underneath these feelings? And so Akibia has this really great first step for leaders who are looking to overcome their own fears as it relates to allyship. And I wish it was a bigger reveal, but you can see it on my screen. It's called the fear onion. And yes, if you're curious, Fear Onion does become funnier the more that you say it. We're big Fear Onion fans in my house, in my team. A few of my colleagues call this their Bloomin' Fear Onion. So this name is flexible depending on your culinary preference. But ultimately, the Fear Onion is a self-reflection root cause exercise. And the goal of this is to peel back some of the layers of our fear. So by the time we get to the center of our Fear Onion right here, we can name our fear, and then we can lean into more authentic behaviors that we'd rather choose to display and start doing that time after time so that we can honor our allyship commitments. So I wanted to share this exercise with you today. And leaders at Akibi would tell you, so if you wanna follow along with me with your own example, you're free to do so. You should pick a fear that's real and tangible, not necessarily hypothetical. And so we're gonna move through this, but maybe, maybe for example, you were asked recently to lead a discussion on diversity in IT. Maybe you were asked to be a spotlight speaker at COSIN and you don't wanna mess it up. But regardless of whatever your fear is, the one that we're gonna go through together today is this fear of I don't wanna disappoint my team. And if this fear resonates with anybody here at all, I just wanna say it's normal, right? It's completely normal to care and to worry about what others think about us. And so if we're gonna move through and peel back the layers of our fear, we have to ask ourselves, if this fear happened, what other fear would emerge? So in other words, why is this a problem for me if I were to disappoint my team? For me, I would feel like a failure. My brain would absolutely make me feel like I am doing something wrong. I'm not living up to your expectations. So the part of this exercise is for us to ask yet again, if this fear happened, what other fear might emerge? Rejection. So that's the deeper fear that looms for me, right? I don't wanna be rejected. 
It's pretty common. I see some people nodding their heads, which is good, right? I don't want to feel rejected and alone. I think we do a lot of things to avoid rejection. We're biologically wired to want to be a part of the in-group, so we fear being seen in this hypercritical way. So if you're following along with this exercise, we have to keep asking ourselves this question and digging deeper and deeper. Why am I afraid? Why am I feeling this fear? And ultimately, we land on, on my vulnerable fear, on this, on this fear onion, around abandonment. We don't need to go deep into anybody's childhood trauma to understand that abandonment is also another pretty common human fear. And so as we move through this exercise, you can see step four here asks us to reflect on how this fear might serve us to be a better leader, to be a better ally. And there's two parts of that, so I wanna show you. So step one, to unpack our core fear, now that we've named our core fear, we can do the work to tame it. So step one asks us to connect this core fear to our autopilot behaviors. So how do you know that you act when you're faced with fear one-on-one? -on -one? Well, personally, I avoid conflict, I freeze up, I run away. And in the long run, I can ultimately understand that this is not the kind of leader I wanna be, not the kind of person, not the kind of ally that I would like to be. It's not how I see myself. So step two asks us to reflect on our authentic behaviors that we'd like to display by answering that question, how does my fear serve me? When we get to this point in the presentation, I can absolutely understand that it seems a little counterintuitive to reflect on our fear, like how does that make me a better leader? But let's imagine that if I don't wanna be abandoned, I can probably imagine that I don't want any of you to feel that way either. So maybe I push myself to create an environment, a team, a space, so that you can bring your authentic self, so that no one feels left out, everybody can feel comfortable speaking up, and so that's how my fear can serve me as a leader. So maybe next time, when I'm faced with my fear one-on-one, -on -one, I start to feel the outer flicker of my fear onion, I can start to it lean into these behaviors that are more action-oriented instead of choosing to avoid conflict, to freeze up, or to run away. And so you can see in the orange call-out box here on my screen, I've listed three authentic behaviors that I've chosen for myself. So maybe, because we're talking about vulnerability, maybe I'll just ask you what support you need. How can I help you that's better than running away? Maybe I'll ask my colleagues for advice if I'm in a vulnerable situation. Maybe I'll just apologize. Maybe I'll just say sorry if I've handled a situation in a suboptimal way. And this is a really powerful example of how you can start to uncover some of your deepest fears, especially as it relates to allyship, and how you can take this back, peel back your layers, and help others on your team or maybe around you in your own personal life. And it's important for us to do this, right? To model the right behavior so that everybody else feels comfortable doing the same. So this is one example, I promised you two on fear. So we're gonna move into an example from my friends at Clark County, home to the famous Las Vegas, of course. And this comes from my friend Bob Leak, who's the CIO of Clark County. And he's dedicated the past decade of his life to being not only a better ally to his IT employees, but also to his community. And so when he joined Clark County, he saw that most, most of his IT employees really wanted to act. They wanted to be allies, they wanted to participate more broadly, but they had no idea where to start. So he would show up to work and there would just be a ton of inaction, although there were many opportunities. So Bob wanted to carve this allyship path to outline all of these different opportunities, these questions that we can ask ourselves about how to be a good ally to other people, but also understand what it means for ourselves. Whenever I talk to Bob, he tells me that this is his hiking trail because it's a lot easier to get on a hiking trail when you know where the trailhead is, when you know what bumps to expect along the way, when you know what the incline is going to be so you can practice and know ahead of time. So here we are. So I want to walk you through each phase. There's four phases of this allyship path. And Bob really wants you to see this as a path that ranges from curious to courageous. So that's how we're going to break it down today curious ally to a courageous ally. All right, here we are. The first part of being a good ally is to ask. Bob says, 
good allies ask questions, great allies answer those questions by themselves. I'm not trying to call anybody out, I just want you to know that if you're looking at these two questions on your screen, how can I be an ally? What does it mean to be an ally? Or how can I understand the lived experiences of others who are different from me? Bob says it's entirely inappropriate for him or for any of his employees that want to be allies to seek out underrepresented communities or persons and ask them, how can I support you? No. These are self-reflection questions. It means do a Google search, watch a TED talk, read a book, watch a documentary, whatever it means for you to answer these two questions on your own, to be curious, to break it down, and to understand and know what it means for you definitively to be an ally. Part two of our journey is to listen. Bob's advice here, if you're in the listening phase of your allyship journey, is to listen to learn, not to respond. Bob wants you to walk away from meetings by asking yourself, how much did I talk? Did I dominate the conversation? Did I take credit for someone else's idea? Did I interrupt people a lot? The more that you can ask yourself these questions, the more that you can recognize and understand how to develop empathy for those around you. And ultimately, it can help us to answer this question, which is self-reflective. What can I do to help others around me succeed? We have to listen to learn to answer that question. Now we find ourselves in one of the more courageous parts of our allyship journey. This is about speaking up. So Bob says, if you're ready to speak up and you find yourself speaking up and you are talking about the specific needs of a particular group and you look around you and you don't see anybody from that group represented, you should absolutely, definitely question any conclusions that were reached. I hope you take that away. I think that's a nice one. And then our last one here, the most courageous part of our allyship path is to show up. Showing up is how we can act as allies to show our commitment time after time. And so you'll notice this graphic is, for example, we put an arrow there to show you that allyship is a constant journey. There's no end to this allyship path. And so sometimes allyship is about showing up and acting as an ally, but it's also about answering these questions and making mistakes and staying on the path, which brings us to part two. But I wanna level set for a second. Because the caveat here with allyship is obviously once we feel confident showing up, practicing allyship, trying new things, asking questions of ourselves, learning what it really means to be an ally, the more mistakes that we're gonna make until we get it right. And I've sat in on a couple of sessions today and we've talked about learning and growth and how mistakes are part of that. So I wanna make sure that we, we keep that in mind when we move to these next couple of sections here. So as we talk about recovering from mistakes and you remember the allyship path, and by the way, if you wanna take the allyship path back to your personal teams or use it in your own journey and introduce it to folks around you, there's an exhaustive list of questions in the appendix of this section and also a ton of advice from Bob. So that's also a good resource. But here, Bob says, what was really nice about having an allyship path was that it gave an opportunity for people to get started, to just show up, know what questions to ask and be on a trail. But what really made the difference was giving them the room and the space that they needed to screw up, to mess up, to make a mistake, and then feel more confident getting back on their allyship path. So I wanna walk you through this. This is an allyship agreement that Bob created for his employees in IT. My friends in HR want me to remind you that this is by no means a legal document. It's not a binding document, it's just an honor pledge. But that's what you're looking at on my screen here is part of our allyship safety agreement for IT. And in the call out box, the point here being that we're helping everyone assume positive intent. So if I'm signing this document, I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing that I'm gonna make a mistake. It's inevitable. And so are you. And we're gonna help each other figure it out and be better, be better to each other, be better to those around us. So that's part one. 
And I want to walk you through each of these sections here because I do think they're really important. So this one, Bob is simply asking us to acknowledge as an ally that we know what behavior is expected of us, both socially and culturally. So if you think back to our allyship path, Bob outlined it for us. We know what questions to ask ourselves, and we know when it's okay to answer those questions by ourselves and how not to go about finding answers. So we know what to do. We're acknowledging that here. In this part, Bob is simply asking that we acknowledge our privilege. We have to understand what that means for us, right? We talked about doing a Google search. What does it mean to acknowledge my privilege? We're also agreeing that we're going to choose to take actions to deconstruct systems of oppression. Those are really heavy words. So I just want to pause here because I think sometimes when I say that, people are like, okay, yeah, but like, no way. There's no way we're deconstructing systems of oppression. Bob tells us that we can do that. We absolutely can do this. We can recognize patterns of racism, of sexism, of homophobia, of transphobia, and we can flag those. We can articulate those. We can recognize them and call attention to them. And that is a wonderful place to get started to act as an ally here. Next, Bob is asking us to acknowledge that we'll help others understand their mistakes by being inquisitive and empathetic. Oh, why is that hard for you? We're not being judgmental, we're leaning in. I want you to be nice to me when I make a mistake too. And finally here, my favorite part, we talked about this idea of pre-planning and pre-scripting. So here, Bob is simply asking his employees to go ahead ahead of time and write down two actions that they will take when they make a mistake as an ally. Let's level set. How powerful would that be if you had a document or a piece of paper that you could refer back to when you've made a mistake screwed up, and you could simply look at this piece of paper and know immediately what you already said that you would do. You could just go and do those actions. So here, maybe in this example, if we're going to use this in our personal lives, maybe we'll revisit our questions. We'll self-reflect. Do we really know what it means to be an ally to a particular community? Maybe we'll go back to our fear onion. We'll peel back some of those layers and understand why we're afraid. Maybe we'll just say sorry, and we won't have to offer an excuse or a reason. And so simply, you can see here in the orange call-out box that Bob just encourages people to understand we're going to get ahead of our mistakes. We're going to acknowledge them. And when I met Bob, Bob taught me a lot about allyship, believe it or not. Bob doesn't just walk the walk. He talks the talk. He told me that he lives by the safety agreement in his personal life. And when he told me this, I did not believe him. I have to say, I thought he was lying to me. But he says the most powerful thing that he can do when he makes a mistake is to say six simple words. And I hope that everybody in here can take this away with them. Thank you for letting me know. Six words. That's it. And I want to use myself as an example. I knew that coming here would be really difficult for me. Because as I said in the opening of this presentation, I use they and them pronouns. And I'm pretty used to having to correct people. Actually, my pronouns are they, them. Thank you. That's it. And sometimes I met with a little bit of discourse or some problems. Some people say, oh my god, I'm the worst. You must hate me. Ugh, I feel terrible. I feel awful. I'm so stupid. Things like that. Or something that's not productive at all, which is they isn't even a singular pronoun, but we, don't, we have 12 minutes, so we can't get into that. But these are things people will say. They're not productive. They don't offer a conclusion to how you feel or how I feel after I've shared that with you. Instead, you could say, thank you for letting me know. It's pretty powerful. And then in the future, you put that in your back pocket. You witness something happen. You interject. And you teach someone, thank you for letting me know. I promise you, this is the, one of the most powerful teachings. Very simple, very effective. Same thing with names. I'm part of a global team. I'm sure many of you are. Names are cultural. They're significant. They're given or chosen. They're how we understand and identify ourselves. So if you mispronounce someone's name over and over and over again, you spell someone's name, especially in, uh, in front of other people, when they correct you, just say thank you for letting me know. Do better next time. So this is a really powerful teaching. It's one of my favorites, and, and I love it. Um, feel free to ask me more about that. But we have one more case that I'd like to show you. 
And this is about creating healthy allyship habits with a buddy. It sounds really simple, it sounds easy to do, and it, and it is, it's part of why I wanted to share it with you. And so this comes from my friend, Lisa Irie, who is the CIO at Des Moines Public Schools. And they noticed that folks at the school were really afraid. They were afraid to get started, but also when they made a mistake, they would quit, they would give up. They didn't wanna try and try and try again. So Lisa implemented a formalized accountability system to help other people stay true, stay true to their allyship commitments. And I'm sure that you know that accountability is one of the best ways that we can go about goal setting and social pressure helps us change our behaviors. So if I know that you're gonna come back around and ask me what I'm doing to be a better ally or to change my behavior, I'm probably gonna do a little bit of work to act a little differently. So here is what Des Moines Public Schools uses their accountability buddies for. Support and optimism. It's easy. We're not alone. You make a mistake, guess what? If I learn from your mistake, I'm probably not gonna make the same one. Right? Pretty simple. We're gonna learn and manage risks. We're gonna use feedback, feedback in a safe space. Maybe if you have an accountability buddy, you teach them thank you for letting me know and then it becomes this really lovely, beautiful cycle. And I know that this was simple, this was kind of a simple case, but something that I thought would be really powerful to end on are a few examples of CIOs who are abiding by the allyship teachings that we shared here today. They're not walking the walk, they're talking the talk. So when I interviewed these CIOs and I knew I was coming here, I asked them to share some advice with you. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So Lisa, Lisa says, to be good allies, leaders must be comfortable navigating the complexity of people's humanity at work. Talked about vulnerability and how it's hard and less than 20% of us feel comfortable leaning into our vulnerability or demonstrating vulnerability. But vulnerability is absolutely required if we wanna navigate the complexity of humanity, right? I think that maybe at the bare minimum. And Lisa's allyship action was to partner with US Cellular to provide homeless youth with laptops, hotspots, smartphones, and internet access. And this is one of my favorite examples of allyship in action because when I asked Lisa how easy this was, Lisa said, oh my God, anybody can do it. I called up a regional office and they were like, yeah, let's do it, let's partner to do this. This allyship action even had a really powerful outcome. Lisa saw that these students were helping their parents get set up for job interviews and then move into more secure housing. So an action that a CIO took really did change students' lives, students' parents' lives. So hopefully that's something that's inspiring for you. And here, this is from my friend Jonathan Young, who is the CIO at FDM Group, which is a recruiting firm in the UK. His advice to you, you must first educate yourself. Begin thinking about your own identity, your own privilege, and start understanding how you can use that to be an ally. Have you experienced privileged in a way that others have not? Because it's only through learning about others that you can stand with and support others. And there's a lot of text on the screen, but Jonathan's allyship action for his PhD research was to create a database, a global database that compared sentiment analyses between minority groups who were applying for jobs in IT and compared those to majority groups who worked in IT. And the goal of this research is to hopefully use this database to be able to help recruiting firms, organizations, all kinds of folks be able to understand what's the problem? Why aren't we retaining people? How come we're not engaging people? And if you're interested in this, it is a public database. The data has been anonymized. But if you want to learn more, please drop me a note on LinkedIn or send me an email. Happy to share. And finally, we land on our friend Bob. We saw two really wonderful examples from him with the allyship path, as well as the honor pledge, the safety agreement. And Bob's allyship advice is that there's 400 plus years of influence and history under this topic in this country. He says that each person, one opportunity at a time, can make one difference for one person to do one thing in a better way. And of course, his allyship action is before helping anybody with the mistakes that they've made, he understands that he first must exhibit humility. So a callback to thank you for letting me know. 
So he says that to encourage others to learn from their mistakes, he must first admit to his own. And I wanted to land here on the key takeaways and kind of recap what we talked about. We talked about unpacking a core fear to understand why we're afraid, what's so scary about getting started. We talked about establishing a path forward for allyship that we can use in our personal journeys or share with our employees or people around us. We talked about recovering from the mistakes that we've made by knowing ahead of time what we can do or what we will do. And we talked about establishing a buddy system for accountability. But before I let you go, I did want to land on one final thing. As a member of the LGBTQ community, my allies are everything to me. They are so near and dear to me. And I would not be able to be on the stage and talk about my pronouns for, for anything. I really wouldn't be able to be here and be my authentic self if it were not for the allies that I have in my life including the allies that I work with. So I really hope as you leave here today that you can take just one thing, just one thing, even if it's the six words, but whatever you take, I hope that you can really commit to learning and growing from your mistakes, some of the failures that you're gonna make, but ultimately practicing compassion and empathy for those around you, being kind to yourself, leaning into vulnerability, and understanding what it means for you to practice and demonstrate allyship. It has been such a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for having me, and I really look forward to seeing all of you over the next day. Thanks.